Coming up. Oh. The king of the bush shows me some moves. That's one loser. Oh, just got the whip on the leg. I get hands on with critters from another world. And it is massive. And protective parents stand their ground. The sound of the sea, a game of cricket on the sand, and a good read. All the joys of a visit to the beach. What could be better? Well, for me, it's rock pooling. The time-honoured tradition of scouring a rocky beach to discover some jewels of the sea. No matter how old you are, rock pools can be a bit of fun. Whether you're looking for starfish that turn their bellies inside out, octopus, snails or shells, it's a great way to get outdoors and explore. Now, rock pooling is easy. All you need is a reasonably sheltered rocky seashore, a good pair of sturdy shoes, a good smear of sun cream, and if you're out for more than a few minutes, you'll need a hat too. Today I'm somewhere special. This is Tasmania and I'm at the tessellated pavement. This place is famous around the world. Basically, the cracks were formed when rocks fractured by the movement of the earth split even more over time as salt crystallised between the cracks and began disintegrating them from within. That didn't happen overnight. It took millions of years of that tide coming in and out, replenishing the salt. And it's that tide coming in, and more importantly, going out, that offers the opportunity to investigate another world. This rock is alive. There are critters all over it. Now, the most common one are these cytons. Now, cytons are a prehistoric mollusk. Look like a trilobite. They've got eight parts to the shell, and they stick onto the rocks. They feed on the little microorganisms. But one clever thing they do, and it's like the slaters or some bugs that you might find in your backyard, they can curl up in a ball, just like this. And that hard shell protects them. Now, the best thing on this rock are the giant elephant snails. There's one stuck to the top, and there's another in the water here. And they're not like any snail you'd be used to seeing. That's their shell, and it's only just on top. The rest of the snail looks like a slug and they're slimy. They get their name because of that nose, looks like a trunk. And they too just feed on all the organisms around the edge of these rocks. It's really important you consult a tide table before you set off. You don't want to be caught out either way. Tides can turn quick and in no time can be in and around you. So be careful. Sea anemones are found the world over and come in all shapes and sizes. Some nearly two metres in diameter. They have their little tentacle-like arms just waving out there in the water. And when an unsuspecting bit of food comes past, they might be sticky or they might sting them. Either way, they then close and envelop themselves and digest whatever it is that they've caught. These are called cushioned starfish. They come in all sorts of colours and sizes. And starfish are pretty amazing. If they lose an arm for a particular reason, they can simply grow it back. But the way they eat is what I like the most. They actually turn their stomachs inside out and they regurgitate the digestive juices onto a rock and they eat the algae and microorganisms. There you go, you can see that one's eating. All of that food there is what it's picked up off the rock and now it's starting to digest it. They actually stick to the rocks with all these little arms. They're all folding in now. Now the important thing with any sea creatures that you find is to put them exactly where you found them. These little environments, even in a short distance here, are really different. And they pop them right back in their little spot. Number one. There you go, it was stuck to my hand. Where are these new babies? There they are. Hello, Mum and Dad. Oh, you can settle down, it's all right. Where are these little chicks? Today I'm concerned about some new arrivals. I know there's two chicks. I saw them early this morning. Right now they're under Dad. These tiny bundles are just six hours old. They're rare and endangered in some parts. They're bush stone curlews. Listen. <whistles> Listen to that. That's brilliant. That's Mum and Dad calling out to another pair of curlews. And they're just saying, this is our territory. Bushstone curlews are one of my favourite birds. They used to be pretty common and widespread throughout New South Wales and Victoria. 
New South Wales now, they're endangered. They're almost gone. On the central coast where I live, uh, there's six pairs. There should be hundreds. In the southern Australian states, breeding programs are now essential to the bushstone curlew's survival. I suspect these latest arrivals are starving. There's a known problem with curlew chicks in captivity, and that is their parents don't feed them properly and the chicks can sometimes die. So what I'm going to do is scatter some food around and what I want to see is mum and dad come back, they're just there now, is come back and start and pick up. And the chicks should come along and take that from mum and dad. That's what would normally happen. After giving the adults a helping hand, I'm desperate to see some of those wild paternal behaviours. I've not seen any of the behaviours I wanted to see. Mum and Dad have had a picket feed, but they've not presented anything to the chicks. The chicks are hungry, they need a lot of food. Time is critical. The helpless chicks won't survive if the adults don't start feeding them. I don't know why this happens with curlew chicks. There's just something there when it comes to food. They're great parents. They defend the chicks, call out to them, keep them warm. I just wish that mum or dad would pick a piece of food up and offer it to the chicks. I'm starting to get worried. I'm back in the aviary, and this is the part that hurts. This is the hard part. I've just made the heartbreaking decision to separate the newborn curlew chicks from their parents. The main concern is if I don't do this, I could come here tomorrow and find no curly chicks. I'm going to make this as quick as possible. I don't want them to hurt the chick either. There's one. The protective parents aren't happy. OK. Hey, settle down, guys. I know they simply can't feed their babies. There we go. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Here, I've just grabbed the chicks. But there's a behaviour that I've never seen before in curlews. The female is pretending she's got a broken wing or wings, and she's trying to lead me away from the birds. And if I was to follow, and let's pretend I was a predator in the wild, she would take me right away from these chicks. That's just amazing. She's doing it right now. Look at that. Wow. There's two little curlew chicks. Have you ever seen anything as beautiful as that? It's pretty sad, but it's just something that's got to happen. There's a silver lining here, and that is because mum and dad no longer have the chicks, they'll breed again, and they can do that two to three times in the year. Now, I could end up with six curlew chicks instead of two, and for an endangered species, that's got to be a good thing. What I want to see now that'll make me feel a bit better is to get these chicks up the top and see them eat. Australia's toughest and its biggest lizard, the Parenti. That's Parenti poo, and a big one by the amount. Now their poo is similar to a lot of animals. But the white patch here, well that's uric, and that is we without the water. It's dehydrated because in this environment, it doesn't come out fluidy. They don't want to waste that fluid. So it's dehydrated and they reabsorb it. That's why it looks like this. Now these pellets here, good to have a look through. There's a lot of roos and rabbits around here. So all of this fur is from whatever it's been eating. Too hard to tell, but roo or rabbit. If you're lucky, sometimes you'll find a bone, a little jawbone of a marsupial or a reptile. They'll eat almost anything, perennies. Snakes, lizards, geckos, birds, rats, mice, marsupials. This is a bit of a treasure hunt. Looking through perenny poo, you never know what you'll find. Oh, here we go. That's actually a perenny tooth. They shed their teeth, they fall out. And when he's eaten this, he's lost a tooth. Look at that. That's brilliant. Now oh, here's a little cave. Now something like that's exactly where a perenni's gonna shelter through the hot part of the day. It's only mid-morning now and I've come up on the rocks for a bit of a look, but I think my best bet is down on the flat. That's where the rabbits are, roos are, and that's where the prennies will be. I might check here later.
This is the perfect habitat. We've got a rock escarpment up there, which means there's caves, shelter. The perennial can get cool and escape the midday sun. But down here, we've got graziers. Rabbit poo, kangaroo poo. It's mid-morning now, perfect time. And I would expect the perennials to come down off the hill and be here looking, maybe for an easy feed, a bit of a scavenge. And if that doesn't work, maybe down a rabbit burrow and get a live kill. You'd expect them just to be lurking. They're pretty slow, you know, and they're the king of this country. They just walk around. I mean, the only thing that could threaten a perennial is a monstrous king brown, and he'd probably try and eat that too. So they're not going to be afraid of me. I've been told there's a fella that roams these parts. A real character. Prenny, Prenny. Big lizard. Look at this. Look at that. Hello, mate. Ah, oh, that's a good sized male there. Not as big as they get. That's maybe oh, 1.2, 1.3 metres. Hello. This is Australia's biggest lizard. And it's up there with the biggest in the world. Even though He's black and white dotted. He's still camouflaged, and you can see him there now through that filtered light, the grey and brown colours on the earth. Look, the tail's getting ready to flick. What they do as a defence strategy is, and particularly to other monitors, they'll turn sideways and whack with that tail. OK, mate. Now, he looks like he's ready to run. He's there poised, and they are so quick. They don't have a lot of stamina, so if he takes off and I can keep up with him... Look at that tail. If I can keep up with him, I'll be able to grab him. But hopefully, I can just come in behind. You're right, mate. Come on, buddy. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Oh, that was a big tail whip. Oh. That's it. Come on, mate. Hey, settle down. Settle down. Got him. Look at that for a lizard. You got me with that tail, mate. Look at that tongue. That tongue's the way of finding food. And it's forked, all monitors are, like snakes. And each time he flicks it out, it enables him to pick up which direction the scent's coming from and follow it to the food source. It's the perfect time of day, and especially to catch him, because he's still a little bit cool. I can feel his body temp there, and he's not really hot if he was. He'd be much more of a handful to hold. Perennies are terrestrial. Young ones might venture up in the trees to grab themselves an egg or a chick, but adults, they stay on the ground. What a lizard. Look at that muscle. That tail. Hey, you're all right, mate. You're all right. Look at those claws. Right in my arm and they hurt. Ah, get that off, please. That tail's just solid muscle. He'll use it to attack and defend himself. A whip from that will easily break a dog's leg. You know, as big a lizard as he is, he's still camouflaged out here. I didn't see him until I was pretty close. I'm a bit nervous holding him there. He's being real well behaved. With their pace, Parentes are active hunters, but they're opportunists as well. They'll ambush prey if they can. A passing rat, a lizard, even a snake will make it on the menu. And don't count out a scavenge. With their backward turned, razor sharp teeth, they'll eat almost anything. It's been found in the last few years, very recently, the perennies are actually venomous. So are a lot of monitors. Komodos are the best example. And the way their venom works is they have primitive venom glands. And they actually excrete venom into the mouth. And then you get a cocktail of dirty bacteria in the mouth from the food that they're eating, the venom. Basically, when they bite their prey, if they don't kill it right then, it'll die later. Go into shock. I do not want to bite from a perenni. All right, I'm going to let him go now. He's bathed pretty well. That's one lizard. Oh, just got the whip on the leg. That's one lizard I'll never forget. Off you go, mate. King of the bush. on the southeast coast of Tasmania. Wherever the tide is out, there's always a whole other world to explore. And this place is bursting with life. 
All of these shells here are mussels, and the beds just cover the rock, and they're secured to the rock. They're fastened tight. But at the moment, with the tide out, they're closed. When the water comes in and covers these rocks, they open up, and they begin to fill to the water. And in doing so, and passing that water through, they extract the nutrients, and that's how they feed. There are two tiny little orange starfish just here. And when I pick them up, they might not look that impressive, but they are. They're endemic to this area. That means they're found nowhere else on Earth, just southeastern Tasmania in these tidal margins. And they're called live-bearing starfish. There we go, there's two. Now, I told you they were small. They've actually got five little arms, but they're almost the shape of a pentagon. And they get their name because their babies actually develop under the skin in little sacs. And when they're ready to hatch or be born, they break through the surface of the skin. They live right up high here in the tidal margin. And they do that because they're so small. They're a cannibal starfish out further. And if they live there, they'd get eaten. The thing you don't need when out rock pooling is a net. They can hurt the ecosystem, so it's best that you just use your hands. You'll be pretty safe with most sea creatures in rock pools. But if you're not sure, just leave it alone. They say time waits for no man. Well, I reckon that applies to the tide as well. Now, I've got a few minutes left to seek out something special. I know they're here. That's the other thing about rock pooling. All it takes is a little bit of patience. Something will always turn up. There's one critter I really wanted to see here today, and it's taken me a fair while to find one. But he's under this rock. Look at that. These sidons are everywhere, just prehistoric, and they look it. But the one I was looking for is just here. And I bet you can hardly see him because he is perfectly camouflaged. Oh, there's two. Another little one. It's called a decorator crab. And it gets the name because it decorates itself to camouflage from predators. Now, that weedy-looking rock is, in fact, a crab. And if I turn him over, you can see his nippers just on the inside there. See if you'll walk. There he goes. You won't find camouflage much better than that in the animal world. And there's another little one here, a tiny one. Not camouflage quite as good, but still looks exactly like a rock. And when they get big enough, they'll head out to sea. But for now, this is their nursery and this is where they're safe. And no trip to a rock pool would be complete without a crab. And what a special crab that is. I'm going to put him right back where I found him. I've just found a ginormous starfish. I'm not exactly sure what species it is, but my guess would be that it's carnivorous. And on the menu are other starfish. It's moving around this pool, hunting, and it is massive. Look at that. And they're pretty incredible. If they lose an arm in a battle, they just grow it back. And inside here, that's where it digests its food. So what it would do is actually get over the top of another starfish. It uh, turns its stomach inside out. And that would actually cover and envelop the other starfish. And then its digestive juices start to break it down. What a beast. Seven arms. And when it moves in the water, these little tentacle-like things stick out and you can see it feeling its way. I think when it finds another starfish, that's what it's going to do, is put that arm over, slowly move over the top, and engulf it. I'm going to put him back there. It's spiky and slimy and sort of feels like it's going to hurt me. See you, mate. I reckon I could go on for hours looking for seaside wildlife along these shores. But it's time to make a move before that tide comes in and catches me. Little mateys, time to get weighed. Here you go, just sit in there for a minute. Today I'm trying to save two tiny bush stone curly chicks. Who's first? Okay, you. I'll tear that back to zero. Sit down, matey. 19 grams. Every day going forward, I want them to be heavier than the previous day. When I have a look at both of them, what I feel for is, once they've had a good feed, 
their belly puffs out and it's full, it's full of food. But on these two, I can't feel much at all and that means they've absorbed the rest of their yolk sac. So what I've done is the right thing. My finger is going to be mum or dad's beak and if they took some food right now, I'd be the happiest man on earth. I'm gonna try a cricket. Here we go, look at the interest. Look at this. Almost, mate. Whoop, close. Yes, that's brilliant. I don't know what happens in the aviary with mum and dad, but the food we offer, it's just not right for the parents, but it's right for the chicks. I mean, that's brilliant. Let's go for number two. Here we go, who wants this bit? Go on, mate. Go on. The second chick isn't showing much interest. Here you go, mate. Come on, mate. Here we go. You can do it. Yes. That's the best thing I could have hoped for. It's tough taking them from mum and dad. I know I can get them to eat, but when they do, it makes it all worthwhile, and I know they're going to be all right. One more bit. Wow. All right, little guys. See you in an hour. You're coming home with me. Come on, mate. Hey, hello, little guy. You doing well? It's been six weeks since I had to make the heartbreaking decision to take these chicks away from their parents. But now my two foster chicks are thriving. Yeah, you're a big fella. You're both looking good. How are your wings? They're looking good, pal. Your wings are looking good. Pretty safe to say that if I hadn't taken them as little chicks, they mightn't be alive today. And who'd want that? The good news is that mum and dad are back on another two eggs. That means the decision to take the chicks was the right one. Curlews in some parts of the country are endangered. That means these chicks form an important part of a captive breeding program. Now, they obviously can't breed together, but we'll pair them off with other curlews, and who knows, maybe one day, their chicks can go back to the wild.